Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and tech related questions. As ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible. Uh, but if we don't answer your question, keep persevering, keep firing them down, hopefully we'll get through to it. So who's up first this right, week, Right, first, first name is very difficult to pronounce, Ezila Monero. I'll go with that. They say they had to reposition and rotate the cleats in their shoes to move their heel outwards because their shoes were rubbing on the frame. Will this result in a problem for my performance or cause an injury? I don't think it will, provided you only move your cleats and shoes a little bit to make your heel clear the cranks in the frame. I don't see it being a big issue. Most people will have their cleats positioned in that way anyway and it's generally considered the sort of most ergonomic position to have your feet in. So yeah. I wouldn't worry about it. Plus, if you're using a pedal system that has float in it, your, that float is there deliberately to allow your foot to naturally track and find the position it wants to be in. So that should mitigate any chance of injury. It, but if you are unsure, um, you can always just go and see your local sort of bike fitting specialist who will be able to, to guide you, and that's probably the best thing. Hmm. Good work. Right, next question in is from John Kinder who says, I've had disc brakes for about a year. Is it worth swapping front and rear pads and also front and rear rotors? Thanks. Hmm. What do you think? Well, I would say sort of not, not to worry too much about it. I think, see if they're worn. It's, it's, a, it's a case of how long is a piece of string. It's hard to say, oh, well, it's been a year, so you should definitely change them. It depends on a whole host of different factors, uh, the wear rate. Um, but one thing is that your front will wear quicker than your rear one. So often I change my front pads and front rotor sort of twice in the space of... Does a lot more of the work, doesn't it? it? Yeah, it tends it. to last half the length of my rear one, but that's just me and where I And in I terms run. of swapping them around, you may well find, like many bikes, you have a different size rotor on the front to the rear. On road bikes, it's typical you could see 140 mil rotor on the rear and 100, 160 on the front. So therefore, you wouldn't really swap them around anyway. And the pads are bedded into the rotors. Basically, leave it all be and replace it as it wears out. Yeah, you can also check the wear rate on your pads by taking the wheel out and inspecting them. And take the pads out and inspect them as well. Good work. Um, the next question is from Peter Ramsey who says that I got into cycling recently and I work on cars and I want to start maintaining my bike too. My question is, is there any difference from automotive grease or bike specific grease? I want to take part my clipless pedals and, um, and hub and re-grease them, but all I have is automotive grease. Should I purchase bike specific grease? Well, um, yeah. What's in some take? cases, it's going to Alex vary used a lot. to be a car mechanic. Yeah, so I was going to say in some cases it's going to vary depending on the type of grease and the brands, but as a general rule of thumb, any sort of automotive grease is going to be much, much thicker and heavy compared to a bike-specific grease because it's designed for additional loads and additional force. So whilst it's probably not a problem using that on your bike, it's going to increase a little bit of drag that's within the bearings because that grease is so thick, whereas a grease designed specifically for a bike will be that little bit thinner and slightly better suited to the mm. application. So I do know people who use marine grease, which is even thicker so than automotive grease. another level again. Yeah, like super thick grease that you have in sort of outboard motors on, on boats. Um, and again, yeah, it does increase that drag factor, but it means that it's far more weather resistant. Things yeah, it will last stays in longer. place a lot better. So it depends it? what you want. Mm. At the extreme other end of the spectrum, um, pro mechanics. I know that Vincenzo Nibali used to get his mechanic to put in sewing machine like oil lubricant, oh, yeah. sewing machine oil into uh, his his bearings on his bike every single day of a Grand Tour before the stage because he wanted it running freely and that would create that sort of free spinning crank that was like shh, yeah. but it would wash out like that so it had to be replaced every day. Um, so I think in my opinion, simple answer is if you're going to do lots of maintenance on your bike and you're going to look to do lots of work and service everything, maybe invest in a bike specific grease. But if you're just doing the odd little job here and there and you've got automotive grease, I'm sure that'll be fine. Yeah, and certainly in the headset yeah. where it's not spinning at high RPM. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Next question in is from Matan Ghazi who says, hi to all the GCN crew. Hi. Can a 12-speed chain set work with an 11-speed cassette and chain? For instance, can the Altegra R8100 crankset work with an Altegra R8000 group set? Thanks. 
While you could bodge it, it's not yes. designed for it. No. So you're not going to have optimal shifting. The chain is not designed to fit on that, that gauge um, chain rings. And the, the gap between the two chain rings is slightly different as well. So you are risking dropping the chain. It, I mean, the, these things are so well designed and engineered, it probably will work. Yeah. but it's just not going to work optimally. So Certainly, in an official answer I think you'd get from any manufacturer or component manufacturers, they would say not to mix and match their different series of components. However, you may well want to take the risk and see if it works, because chances are it might, but I wouldn't really recommend it. Stick to the components that are designed to work together, and you should have no problems. Uh, next question is from Ariel Rosenfeld who says, how do you know when your tire needs replacing after a puncture? I have a beaded tire and I got a puncture on my last ride which left some holes in it. I replaced the inner tube, inflated it, and it seems to be holding. Thanks for your help, Ariel from Israel. Firstly, the first thing I want to say is that if you do get a puncture on your inner tube tire and normal tire, you don't just have to replace it. It's really going to depend on how severe the damage has been caused to your tire. Nine times out of ten, you can just refit an inner tube or patch the inner tube up and away you go again, happy days. But if something large has punctured the tire, large enough that when you've got the tire off you can actually see straight through it, it may well be worth considering either replacing a tire or even an option is to look to patch the inside of the tire up and you should be good to go again. Yes, the big, one of the biggest problems is that if you have a large cut in your tire, the inner tube can actually hemorrhage out yeah. and, and it starts to push through the tire and then that can cause a sudden bang as it pops and a sudden failure which you don't want to happen when you're riding. Like a puncture so easy wouldn't it? But yeah, yeah it ca that can be fixed with, with patching yeah. uh, the inside of the tire as, as Alex says. And One of the most annoying things in the world, brand new tire, get a big puncture and it's nearly ruined it. That In that instance you always want to patch it up, you don't want to just chuck away your new tire do you? Yeah. Next question in is from Mike Wallace who says, hi gang. Hey, is it feasible to fit DI2 to a frame with full external cable routing? Would neatly drilling the required holes for routing cables internally on an alloy frame weaken the frame too much? They say they're not worried about the warranty. Obviously, the last thing they would want to do is cover the bike in cable ties or make it unsafe. Yeah, I, this is a, an interesting question. I can understand why you wouldn't want to have exposed external DI2 cables. They are more vulnerable. Than, than, a, than a normal transmission cable, and it's going to look a bit messy, isn't it? It's not going to be the tidiest. While it is possible often to sort of drill little holes and feed things through in, in aluminium frames, and they should be structurally fine, it's hard to say without seeing the specific bike and the hole and the location. Well, it depends how competent you of a you know, workman you are, you know, like yeah. whether you're particularly skilled in that area or not. Yes, and much easier solution, as I see it, is go for wireless and just yeah. fit SRAM uh, to it and go, uh, you know, ETAP. You can get rival ETAP now. So that would probably be my my choice of what I would aim to do for that. Simplest solution, upgrade, get ETAP. <laughs> there you go. Right, next question in is from Jojo Lingsi who says, first of all, hello to all GCN. I'm from the Philippines where mountain bikers are so common that they're even used for road riding. Um, which also, I'm one of them, so they say they ride mountain bike on the road. That's because mountain bike is much cheaper and more economical than road bike. What can you suggest to make your mountain bike faster and more adapted to fast road riding? I, well, I would say slap some, slap some little tri bars or some oh, spinachi bars yeah. on the middle of the thing so that when you do get onto the road, you can then get into that position like that and that will make a huge difference to how fast you travel. Well, the advice I would give is to switch to a more lightweight mountain bike tire. That could be a completely slick tire if you're mostly going to be riding on the road, or one with a slightly less aggressive tread pattern. And generally on a mountain bike, people will run tubeless tires. But that'll mean that your tire is going to roll a lot faster on smooth or sections of road. And also, if you are then traveling at a high speed, you might want to look at getting a slightly larger chain ring because you might find you run out of gears. Yeah. Good, good advice. Uh, final question this week is from Bob Langan, who says, are certain pedals and cleats better for certain types of riders? For example, are speed play pedals advisable for bigger riders who put out a lot of power? Or is the idea that they don't provide as stable a platform as a look SPD um, 
is that a fiction? Yeah, that is a fiction. Yeah. Um, because, well, speed play paddles, a lot of big track riders use speed plays uh, who put out way more power than most of us. Um, although the little speed play lollipop is quite small, you should really look at it as the pedal and cleat combined. And the cleat surface on a speed play is actually very large. Um, so that actual surface sort of contact is actually pretty big. Um, so yeah, that is a that is a fiction. That was unfortunately our last question for this week's GCN Tech Click. And then if we didn't get to your question, as Ollie said at the start of the show, please do keep submitting it in the comments section down below. And if you like this video, give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to GCN Tech for all things bike tech related. Should we go and get some lunch? Yes. Right. Let's do it. Come on. See ya. Ciao. Oh, lovely.